first year of doctoral work, I realized that if I graduated on time, I would be unemployed. The job market was that bad in the mid 80s. So I dropped out. I'm a Berkeley dropout. I went to work to pay off my student loans, all $3,000 of them. And so during that period of time, I had already met in the Berkeley program a good number for the first time in my life of extremely serious practicing Catholics. And with one of them, she's now the director of Catholic studies at DePaul as an expert on Catherine of Siena, her name is Karen Scott. We would walk every, su every Sunday down to St. Albert's. And so I had met the Dominicans. And while I was working in the bookstore and planning to go back home and become a, probably a, some kind of stock trader, I decided that was not what I was going to do. And I heard the voice of God calling and so I entered the order. I did my usual studies in philosophy. And in those days, it was after philosophy, we went on our residency year. I went to Benicia to our small parish up there, our oldest house. A wonderful year. And when I was ordained a deacon two years later, we were all called over to the provincial house. And so the provincial said, well, we have decided that you're going back to finish your doctorate if you can get the money. So I got the money and re-entered the program and did it simultaneously with my theology for two years. And then when I was ordained in, 19, in the spring of 1985, uh, four days later, I left for Italy to write my dissertation, which was on preaching by Dominican and Franciscan revivalists and the way they took over city governments and rewrote city laws. And that was eventually my first book published. Uh, one of the things that happened was when I got back from Italy and was filing the dissertation, I talked to the provincial. He said to me, uh, I want you to go find a job. That ended up with my being hired at the University of Oregon where I taught for 10 years and was tenured and became department head. Then I was recruited to teach in religious studies and history at Virginia where I was for another 10 years. Well, by this time I had been teaching in secular institutions for almost 25 years and I said to a provincial, I said, is it possible that after serving Caesar for 25 years I can now serve God? And he said, yes, I think it's time for you to come home. And so six years ago, I arrived at DSPT. One of the things that's most important in interpretation of historical texts is the chronological order of the texts. Uh, biblical critics worry about this a lot because the development of early Christianity in the first century into the second century depends on what order you read the texts in. And so my project was to read the texts on Francis in the, in the chronological order they were written, first his own writings and so forth, recognizing that they're all addressing a particular situation, rather than reading later things like the Romantic Francis, who is usually taking ideas that are 14th century from the little flowers of Francis and retrojecting that back. Uh, so it was a simple-minded attempt to reconstruct Francis from the best sources we have for him in the proper historical order and to hold a filter on the things where even in the Middle Ages people were retrojecting later ideas back. And what's the surprising thing about it is that if you read the texts in order, uh, what you find is that poverty is not Francis's central concern. It becomes the central concern about 30 years after his death when Franciscans who are fighting about how to live poverty start to generate texts purporting to be from Francis and purporting to be stories about Francis which are filled with all sorts of ideologizing about Franciscan poverty. Uh, Francis says, what is poverty? He says this in the letters to the brothers and sisters of penance. And he says, uh, the greatest act of poverty when, was when God who is rich beyond belief and powerful beyond all imagining, laid aside everything of his divinity in order to become a human being. And God did not stop there. He became a human being and then in his life subjected his humanity to the service of others and also to the abuse of those who, who hated him and eventually offered it up freely to die on the cross. That's poverty, but he didn't stop there. He then took this flesh which he had taken, which he now died and was resurrected, and he gives it as food to us in the Eucharist. That is the greatest act of poverty. 
It's done by God, and it is when the crucified Savior gives us himself in the Eucharist as food. And uh, if there's a mysticism in Francis, it's not nature mysticism. His mysticism is entirely Eucharistic and Catholic.